You're listening to Bigfoot Society Podcast, hosted by our captain, Jeremiah Byron, where it's all Bigfoot all the time. Have you ever had the urge to do more, to be more? Now you can by joining Bigfoot Society on the Patreon. Get ad-free episodes and even member-only episodes. Take part in movie night and even live video chat. Interact behind the scenes with Jeremiah and other Patreon members like me, Leia. The powerful podcast goes on and you may contribute a verse in our Patreon community. Carpe diem. Seize the day, Bigfooters, and make your lives extraordinary. Welcome to Bigfoot Society. If you have Bigfoot activity to report from the same areas discussed in this episode, please reach out to me directly after this episode. And if you'd like to be on the podcast to discuss a personal Bigfoot encounter, please reach out to me directly at BigfootSociety at gmail.com. Do you wish there was more Bigfoot Society to listen to every week? Well, there is now. If you become a supporting member over at Patreon, you get a special members-only episode every single week on Wednesdays and sometimes even more episodes. Head on over to patreon.com forward slash the Bigfoot Society. And now let's get on with the show. All right, Bigfoot Society, we've got the privilege of talking to Jason from Tennessee today. He's an individual that had left some comments on the Bigfoot Society YouTube channel. And I always try to reach out uh, to those comments that look very interesting. And uh, thankfully, Jason was able to uh, reach back out. And uh, so we've set up a time for him to come on the show. And uh, Jason, it's great to to finally have you on here and you're going to share a few things that you've experienced over the years, but I'll let you go right into it, man. Awesome. Yeah. I appreciate the opportunity. Hi everyone. I just want to say out front, I'm sharing all of these because they're very strange and I feel like I can't be the only one. And I, I feel like everyone needs to kind of share their stories and it's something that a lot of people back in the day didn't do. So I'm going to start 10 years ago in Louisiana. I had a boot camp. I'm a Navy veteran. I had a boot camp buddy of mine out there just outside of Lafayette in an area called Abbeville. And I was actually quite a ways, quite a few miles away from Abbeville. There's a state park out there called Palmetto State Park. And I was on the other side of the road, probably one to two miles down, very underdeveloped area, the floodplain or whatever got up to, or the the surge or whatever they call it, got up to 10 feet out there. If you did build out there, your house had to be on stilts. And I think the minimum was 10 feet. So anyways, my, my, my Navy buddy was like, Hey, come down here, work in the oil fields. If you need to, I got 10 acres. You can go out there and kind of do your own thing and get your feet set. So I lived in those kind of woody, swampy area for about two and a half months. I did a bushcraft thing and chopped down trees and paracord and kind of built this little cabin out there. And I had a dog. He was a mutt, but he looked like a Belgian Malinois with a beagle face. And he was about 35 pounds. He was kind of like a military dog. Mentioning him because he's kind of the heart of the story. He was always on lookout. I traveled a lot. So he just had military kind of characteristics. And my little hut that I built, he would sit in the doorway and just look out all night long. And I had a little fire on the inside. I'd be sitting to the right of him in front of my fire, my my door and dog to my left. And two nights in a row, he acted like a dog I've never seen act in this way. And he would snap his head back and forth. He was looking at something outside and would snap back at me. And I mean, it was like so fast of him looking out back at me out back at me out back at me and he was he would start to shake he would even give me slight very very quiet whines usually he was very aggressive barking going out chasing things growling there are a lot of animals out there i mean there were porcupines not porcupines uh, armadillos raccoons rabbits bobcats bears hogs um 
So to see this reaction out of this dog, which I've never seen before, kind of triggered me, but I didn't hear anything out there. A lot of times I would go out and try to scare things away with them. But that night stood out. So the very next night it happened again. And this time I thought something was up. Before, the night before, I kind of just let it go. I told him to calm down. I didn't hear any noise near me, so I didn't feel like there was a threat. This night, now um, I'm a little bit more kind of in tune with it because this is so strange. And then I start hearing something bipedal walk, and it sounds heavy. Now, to let you know, my buddy's property had 10 acres. I was kind of set up on the edge of a clearing. And this clearing, he brought in dirt and clay. Maybe it was 60 yards long by... 60, 70 yards long by maybe 40 yards wide. It's not a big clearing. He wanted to put a little house there. He had a little tiny kind of pond. There was a canal. I decided to walk out when I heard the bipedal walking, and it sounded heavy. It sounded loud. And when I came out, <clears throat> I only had a headlamp. And when I turned, I'm looking at a set of eyes that were yellowish green. The eyes were very far apart. I'll never forget just kind of the mental image of what would look like with these eyes so far apart. And at 30, 40 yards, I was still looking up at it. Like I had this feeling of I'm still looking up at it. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. The next day I went and bought a huge flashlight because it was just so different. I mean, your whole life you're used to human beings a certain size and the eye distance away and it, it just, it stood out. And I'm sitting there staring at these eyes. My dog came out with me. He's right on my right side. We don't have a gun or anything. I actually made a spear with a big knife I had. That's all I had. And I'm staring at it. It's staring at me. And I just kind of got a weird feeling. It was like, okay, we're going to, I looked at my dog and I was, I said, we're going to sit this one out. And I went right back inside. Never heard it walk away. The next day I went out and tried to find tracks but like i said he brought in dirt and clay it was really weird if it if it rained it'd be super muddy tracks of course but when it dried it was it was actually like tabletop hard which would explain maybe why i heard it and explain why there were no tracks i originally thought it was a bear but bears down there are pretty small even if they stand up they're six foot I'm six foot two, six foot three, and I, I, I'd assume I would see claws if a bear stood up. At some point, claws would have dug in, and I never found any tracks. So that's my first story. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was Bigfoot. Maybe it was something else, but it was big. It had eyes far apart. And on like an intelligence level if it was there for two nights the first night it was just kind of watching me the second night it wanted me to know it was there like i said i never heard it walk away so i i it definitely stood out as something strange so that's kind of my first experience that opened me up i already was into kind of the bigfoot possibility and and there being things out there that are intelligent and stealthy but that that kind of opened up Pandora's box. Now, currently, I am living in a truck and truck camper. I'm raising a Belgium Malinois, and I've been living in the National Forest for the past year and a half. I'm preparing this dog for Alaska. I'm moving to Alaska to buy property way out in the bush. I do plan on getting him a big brother, but he's going to be my my right-hand man out there. So... My journey started in northern Idaho. This is what sparked all of this in the comments because I saw northern Idaho, Bigfoot story, and I have my own. I was in Sandpoint, Idaho. If you leave Sandpoint and you head towards Bonner's Ferry, there's a gas station on your left, maybe three to four miles down. Right there at the gas station, if you take a left, that'll take you till you hit a dirt road, then a big kind of open area for the snowmobiles and four-wheelers to park their trails, trailers. Excuse me. And then you can just ride for miles. I mean, you can take this route all the way to Coeur d'Alene, you can, I mean, it, it takes you to other cities. It's, it's a dirt road you can go far back on. Now, for the first, I don't know, 10 miles, 
or so, you're you're along a river. Not far down the path, I would stay all the time. There's, I'm trying to think of how to best describe it, but within two to three miles down on your right hand side, there's going to be accesses to this river, and you'll get to one to where there's a big. You're going to have this dirt road, rocky, bumpy, getting down, and you'll get down to the river. There'll be a campsite. You'll take a right, more rocky, going downhill. There'll be probably five campsites or so lined up down this river with spacing with trees. I mean, it's a nice area. You'll know this part of the river if you explore that area because this is probably the only place that's got really kind of a long stretch of sites people can camp on anyways i'm out there it's the end of the summer everyone's back to school there are no campers i'm by myself and i'm out there with my dog and it's dusk and i start hearing a life beacon Now, I was in the Navy, and part of my job was doing life buoy watch. We would be on the back of the ship, and we were the last line in case you fall off. We're the last last person that has a chance of seeing you. And we also called in, like, surface-to-air ships, but whatever. The point is, is I had this buoy that I'd throw off, and it would start to beep. And that's what it, it reminded me of. So in my mind, I'm thinking someone's out there and needs help. And which is strange because the main road to the national forest isn't that far. I mean, it might be 50 yards from the river and the section I'm in is pretty low. So when you get close to that main road, it's kind of a vertical, maybe 20 foot vertical up to the main road. And the noise, the, the life beacon is coming right next. It's coming from right next to the road. And as I try to find this beacon, it's a very dense kind of off the beaten path as far as the campsites go, but right next to the main road. And I'm getting closer to it. My dog at the time, he was probably a 10 month old Belgian Malinois. He picked up on nothing. He's having a good time. He's out there sniffing around. But when I get really close, I decide to get high ground and backtrack a little bit, get on the main the main road and look down at whatever this is and as i get up there the it's so dense that i can't see and it's getting darker so i decide i just get the the feeling that i need to go down to my truck i have a high powered flashlight and i want to get my my handgun so it's probably a five to ten minute walk to get down and back up and i get back to that exact same spot i mean i swear as soon as i let my foot down and i'm right there the life beacon and i didn't hear it where where i'm looking where it was the life beacon is now behind me across the road and possibly 50 50 yards away now this gets a little weird because there's a campsite over there that was overgrown. I mean, no one had gone through there. There was a massive like ditch I had to go through to camp over there. And the only reason why I camped over there is because during the summer, the river spots were, were full. So I'd go camp over there. And honestly, I got there and I got weird vibes. There were probably six to eight trees bent over the trail. One was snapped at about 12 foot. And it's just strange because you would have to like tie these trees off in some type of way. And this trail was just kind of covered. When I camped there, my dog would bring me antlers and like femur bones. Like he would keep bringing me bones. He would go off into the wilderness and find stuff. Uh, I heard a wood knock out there. Uh, at night, my dog would lose his mind. Something would be outside of our camper. Um, I tried to hike past the, the bent trees and I just got really bad vibes. And I was like, no, I'm not going up this way. I'm not doing it. So I already had this weird history of this campsite. And now the beeping or the life beacon is coming from over there and i do want to say that when i first heard this life beacon i was recognizing the pattern shifting it sounded so mechanical and real but once in a blue moon it sounded like a bird 
it, it, once in a blue moon, the, it would like beat for 20 seconds, off for 20 seconds, beat for 20 seconds, off for 20 seconds. But I was just recognizing slight changes in the patterns. So at this point now that I'm hearing this beep over here in this area that I already got weird vibes and wood knocks and i even saw something one morning when i pulled out of there i assumed it was the butt of a moose if not it was the shoulder of something big and it just stepped out of the way yeah anyways that that area i just had all these weird weird things happen and then like i said those i was recognizing patterns being off so i'm getting over to this campsite right where the trees are bent over and the, the life beacon is right on the other side. And I decide that this isn't worth it anymore. I'm like, this is this is too weird. I think um, I'm cool with my adventures and trying to save somebody. This no longer seems like someone's in need of, of help. Uh, it's getting too weird. And I decide to walk back. So now I come down this little trail in this campsite. I get back on the main road walk down 20 yards not far and then boom I bank a right and then I go down this path and I get down to that campsite and then you take a right to to, to access the other campsites as soon as I take that right I swear to you to my left across the campsite that I'm turning away from in those woods I'm hearing the life beacon so I in my mind, I went from tracking something to now something's tracking me, and it's letting me know that it's tracking me. And I, I'm still a good little ways from my camper. I keep walking. My gun's on my hip, and my dog this whole time hasn't picked up on anything. I'm blown away at this point because how is he not picking up on this? He is young, but he actually saved us from a mountain lion that was stalking us. So I have faith in him. It's kind of crazy. He never picked up on anything. But anyways, I get down to my, my truck camper, and I'm, in my mind, I'm like, no, it might just, oh, well, you just relax, watch a movie, and we'll, we'll go to bed. And I laid down. Within five minutes, I heard a scream, holler. I mean, it was like a hoot. My first, my first thought was an owl, but it was like a hoot, holler, scream. I, I, I don't, I don't even know. And it trickled down. It's, it got really loud, and then it trickled down to, to a growl. I've been near alligators, like at that Palmetto State Park in Louisiana. I, I went into primitive camping. I heard alligators, and they sound like lions. I mean, they the the my dog was shaking during that too. I mean, they they have a depth that just you can feel it, and it was the same thing with this 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 holler, this who whatever created this noise was massive, absolutely massive, and I and it, and it happened twice. I don't know if it was two separate ones because the second one wasn't as loud. But it was close, and it was the exact same. It was a hoot. It was a holler, and it just slowly worked its way down to this this growl. And I can't imagine it was more than 40 yards away. I'm not going to lie. I want to meet Bigfoot. I really think it would be cool. At the same time, if I do that, I want to be fully prepared because I assume there's good ones and bad ones. And... It's not worth dying over, but I, I think it'd be it'd be really cool. I would like to meet him, but that night, I'll tell you what, I didn't have my night vision, and I didn't have anything that was large as far as weapons go. I had a 357 uh, Magnum revolver and a lever action, and I just I don't know. If I can't see you, and I don't I don't feel like I can defend myself, I didn't want to go out there. I actually decided to leave. And I had to go through the woods and find my dog's toys he left everywhere. That wasn't comfortable, but I got everything. I got out of there and I went to Walmart. To be, to be honest with you, I didn't want to. I didn't feel like they were out to get me. I mean, obviously they could have. If they are intelligent and they wanted me to leave, that was probably the best way to do it. 
And I will say one last thing that I'm going to end that story. That was Northern Idaho. But I will say about 10 miles from there, I did a work to live on a guy's property for 40 years. And I don't know if this has anything to do with Bigfoot, but I just want to share it because if anyone else has experienced this, it's very strange. But he had a really cool piece of property, 40 acres, probably five acres down at the bottom that were flat. And then it was all kind of mountainy. There was a little pond up top and he had little campsites all over the place and I'm in this place and I'm building a fire and I heard something run behind me. It was right behind me and and I turned and nothing was there. It's probably one of the only times in my life I questioned like my sanity because it seemed so real. And I looked at my dog and he didn't pick up on it, but Belgiums are crazy. He wants to chew sticks that are on fire. He was so into the fire. I wasn't too surprised, but then I heard a growl. I heard something growl at me. And the funny thing is me and my dog both looked into the direction of the growl. We both looked at each other and then we both looked in the direction. So I realized that I wasn't crazy and this area of his property had thinned out. So there was really no place to hide. I mean, it wasn't thick like national forests. So I'm just throwing that out there. I don't know if anyone else has experienced anything like that, but something ran behind me, man. And then not far in front of us. I mean, if I had to guess, it was it was close, 20, 30 yards. And heard it growl and my dog picked up on that one. But, but anyways, those are experiences I have, Jeremiah. I hope that helps others. And I think everybody should share. Jason, thank you. Thank you for sharing those. It's really interesting stuff. And the one, man, I'll tell you, like the Sandpoint, oh, Idaho, when you were experiencing the life beacon beeping noises from the woods, that there's really a, a pattern because it, it feels like, well, I'll ask you, did, do you feel like it may have been trying to get you to go further in the woods to try to figure out what was going on with that noise? So there are two thought processes here. Mm-hmm. The one is, yeah. I mean, you can imagine if a Bigfoot ever saw an injured hiker that had a beacon on it that was beeping and then saw other humans show up to save that injured human, they they would mimic that. And I've heard them mimicking screaming children, and that would draw a human immediately. Yeah. It seems a bit strange because on that second beacon noise, it was drawing me away from my camper. Mm -hmm. It was drawing me farther away, which would lead me to believe ill intent. Um, But what's strange is why wouldn't it, why would they make the move? I mean, I guess I got the gun, but I didn't have the gun at first. There's no one out there. It's just me. They're intelligent. I would assume they're intelligent enough they can, that they they know they can overpower me. It, it's a weird it's a weird scenario because then at the end of the day the growl it almost seems like intelligent enough to, to mess with your mind. Would they have drawn me out there? Okay, so I've got I got I've got another part of this story that I didn't share. Mm. So I moved from Sandpoint to Big Sky, Montana, and these boys out here live in the woods. I mean they, I mean it's it's big. And my my one buddy, he's a Marine. He even worked for the the Blackwater Mercenary, whatever. Blah blah blah. He does hunting photography. He goes all over the world and films guys hunting. And then him and a local good old boy that grew up here in these woods were out hunting one day. And they said they heard, I'm sharing my story. And I this is separate. I shared my story with both of them. They didn't know about me or my story. And they both said the same thing to me because they were together, that they heard the same thing. 
they said they followed a life beacon for like two or three hours. When I told them that I heard this, they were like, yeah, we've, we've heard it in the woods too. And I was like, no way. I was like, it sounded mechanical. It sounded like a buoy, like a life beacon or something. Like it sounded mechanical and they were like hundred percent. And it would go in intervals and we followed it dude, for hours. So that leads me to believe that it, it wasn't ill intent and maybe it, it's just this kind of like game for them or kind of like a mind thing. And then the fact they growled. So I know that they were there. It seemed more, it, the vibe to me was we'd appreciate it. If you left, we'll, we'll draw you out of here. <laughs> we'll make you walk 10 miles following this noise to get you out of here. Or we'll growl, scare you out of here or whatever. But that's another part of the story that's kind of weird coming to Montana. I'm six hours away, six, seven hours away from Sandpoint. And hunters heard the same thing and followed it for hours. Yeah. That's that's even more interesting. And it, that's it's definitely a, a thing where... If I think back through all the interviews I've done, there are definitely different accounts where a person will be lured somewhere by the voice of their boyfriend or another person's voice or a pet. There was one, actually, this is in northern Idaho as well, where a pet was, they were trying to lure a pet into the woods by, it was either the, the voice of an the owner or someone else the pet would have known. That was a really weird one. Then you have like the old stories of, of hearing the baby cries in the woods, right? And you hear a lot of those actually in Southeast Alaska. So maybe watch out for that when you're up there where you'll hear baby cries and it's them supposedly trying to lure females into the woods to look for what's causing the baby crying in the woods. And it's just, it's a very interesting and, and this may even be the newest iteration. This this life beacon noise. That's just so weird that it was experienced in two different areas of the country. Now, have you ever heard the life beacon? No, no. This is the first time, and I really no. hope that if other listeners have experienced that, uh, that they would also reach out, maybe in the comments or email if you need to. But that is just it is so weird. Yeah. And, and it's funny how you say it's like the new iteration mm -hmm. because as technology grows, it's almost as if they're adapting to, you know, our ways, our technology. I was blown away when these boys and the, like the reason why I believe them because people are, you know, people will play with you. But the reason why I believe them was because I met these dudes, you know, at different times, different places and they didn't even know, like they were talking as if I didn't know the other guy. They're like, yeah, my buddy Logan or whatever, you know, my buddy. And I'm like, yeah, he already told me the story. I'm like, that, that was real. I was like, y'all are, you're being real. He's like, dude, we followed it for hours. He's like, it just, it stayed the same distance from us. It always sounded the same distance from us. And we're out hunting. He's like, dude, we're, we, we're, we're game. We're out there. And we just kept going and uh, eventually we stopped and we're like, okay, we're going to head back. But it, it kind of makes sense. It's interesting. I hope I, I, I don't know, maybe you can clarify this, but I heard the ones in Alaska were bigger and meaner. Has that been a so, norm? So regarding Alaska, so there's a thing called the Bergman's rule where the further away from the equator you get, the larger the things are the creatures are going to be and and that's why just things are bigger up there right and, or you look at down by right. florida the skunk apes are smaller right because it's closer to the equator and uh, yeah you're correct you have reports up there in alaska of them being extremely large but then you also have areas like prince of wales island which is in southeast alaska where there's reports of uh four toed ones and there's clans on the island where the people that live there, they think that pretty much four-toed ones are stealing people. They're the reason that, that people are disappearing on the, the 
island and they're just they're extremely aggressive so yeah i would i would definitely agree with that that matches up with what i've heard from different sources over the years so that's interesting so yeah i plan on here and the the light changes up there to where it gets dark for months and so i plan on setting up a lot of lights and cameras and i will be prepared to defend myself but like my goal is to try to make contact i'm not sure how that works and if it's just like offering up of food i plan on having at least two to three dogs so i don't i don't want to come off aggressive but at the same time i want to be prepared for anything but i I do have this part of me that wants to kind of engage when and I, i don't i don't i hope that they're like most other animals and the reason why i've been contacted or i've had these experiences like i tell people i joke the bigfoot down there in louisiana was like look at this human like out here fishing for catfish and building fires every night like maybe he's cool <laughs> you know? right yeah and I, i'm also someone that's had a very weird relationship with animals my entire life even bugs dude i've had butterflies like land on me for like 30 45 minutes and i've had witnesses and they will like fight everything that comes near me a butterfly will attack every little other butterfly or fly or bee that comes near me and then come back and like land on me and start dancing i've had carpenter bees the big ones multiple times they'll come right in front of my face like maybe six to eight inches in front of my face and just hang out there and i'll start talking to them and then they'll start like the exact same thing as the butterfly anything gets near me they'll start attacking it and protecting me i've had them protect me from hornets and wasps when i'm doing like remodeling on roofs i mean it's crazy dogs that don't like anybody like me i've had deer come up to me i mean i've just had this natural thing with me i I don't know what it is and maybe that's why the Bigfoot or, or whatever's happening mm. with me. Maybe that's why they're intrigued with me. Maybe I'm on a vibe that they animals in nature vibe with. So I'm hoping I have good relations, but I, I really would like to, I, I am going to try to uh, connect with them. If I'm in Alaska and I'm way out there, I'm going to do my best and I don't want to harm them. I hope they don't want to harm me, but, uh, this this subject is fascinating i think there's the world's much bigger than society and mm. the, the phones and the tv oh, yeah. and everything oh, yeah. that we live within but yeah something yeah, that yeah. i will i'll bring up and i don't know you may have a specific area in alaska already but there's a channel that might be interesting to you if you haven't found it yet it's fred from subarctic alaska sasquatch and his thing is that he just talks to people from Alaska that have had encounters and he shares their stories on his channel. It's fascinating stuff, but he's, he's probably the best resource we have right now for Alaska in general. And the thing is, if you go to his website, there is a a map where he has everything mapped out, all the interviews he's ever done. And so you can see, you can really see the parts of Alaska based on his interviews where there is a ton of activity and he might even be a good individual to to reach out to but definitely a a good place to start there would be that channel that's cool do you know what part of alaska he's in dillingham i believe dillingham oh yeah hold on check it out i'm I'm heading north i i went commercial salmon fishing two summers ago up there so i was all over the southeast and Oh my God, is that every human being on the planet needs to go to Alaska. It's just a a different world. It's absolutely beautiful. And it was always a dream, but I fell in love after that. So, but I I intend on going north to start and we'll see where I end up finding property. I got a realtor sending me property listings now. So trying to hone in on it, but I'm moving up there maybe four or five months. And then I want to put boots on the ground of any piece of property I want to get. So hopefully within the next two years, year and a half, we'll see. I'll have my own little spot, but I'll tell you what, I wouldn't mind reaching out to him. I wouldn't mind a friend up there. 
with some mm-hmm. more interests. Yeah, I think uh, his contact info is on his, his website or his channel, but man, I feel like I feel like this that you've just shared is just the beginning of of your story, man, Jason. I just I feel like you are like right at the beginning of it. And once you get up there, it's gonna yeah. get it's gonna get crazy, <clears throat> dude. That's just what I'm feeling. I think you're right. And my heart's good. And I feel like I don't have ill intentions, which mm. is big. So I'm excited. I want to meet him. I, I, I'm, I'm sold on the idea. I was actually sold on Bigfoot being real. I may have been around that kind of Louisiana experience. But when I was doing all that research, I mean, a joke, it, one of the jokes in the Bigfoot community, I mean, I don't know if, how deep this joke goes, but it's like, it took them like 60, 70 years to find a panda bear. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. I watched a Bigfoot documentary and they, they talked about that. I mean, it took them like 60 years to find a panda. But it's like, if this thing's intelligent, like a human, but has all the talents of your dog, dude, I mean, it, you're never going to see this thing. You're going to see it one in a million on accident, or it's going to want you to see it. It's mm-hmm. curious, just like you. I, 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 I don't know. Yeah. It's no, I, just, uh, I agree. I mean, it's, it's a thing where we don't know the, the abilities that it has, has. And if you look at animals that are already out there, and I'm not saying it's an animal, but if you're looking at things that are already out there, like the octopus, for example, just the way that it can blend in with its surroundings underwater. It gets in front of a rock and boom, it's the, it's the color of the rock and the, and the pattern. So, I mean, there's weird stuff already out there that we know. And what's to say that this guy uh, can't do weird stuff that, you know, just boggles science. So I don't know, man. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm not sold on the interdimensional deal. There's a lot of cool stories out there that, that probably support it, but it's not out of, out of the realm of possibility. I'm just not sold on it yet. But like I said, that, that moment I had with something ran behind me, um, and nothing was there. And then I heard that growl. I mean, that, that just offered up something new, but you know what? At the end of the day, these things are apex, apex predators. The native Americans talked about them throughout their history Apex predators don't just disappear. And if we would have killed them all, we would have bragged about it. Mm. So, I mean, like if the Native Americans know of these things and they were alive during their time, there's just no way they're not alive now. There's just no way. They don't just disappear. And like I said, if we would have killed them off, we would have bragged about it. Like it. I don't have any doubt, even even before my experiences or right around that first one, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, I remember reading something that it was in the National Forest Handbooks pre like 1940 or 1920 or something like that. It just seems like there's enough evidence out there that even the government knows it would make sense that the government would hide them at some point and deny it to protect them. If everyone knew Bigfoot was real, I think every, um, uh, I don't know how to say the word, but every, there'd be enough Americans with guns that would go out there and hunt them all year round. Yeah, it would change everything. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it makes sense that they wouldn't admit it, you know? Mm. It's, It's such a fascinating topic. And I mean, I love it. We'll never run out of, of people to talk to because there's always people coming forward that have waited for years and there's always people that are just experiencing things for the first time sometimes a day before they reach out to me which is just incredible but jason it has been just a privilege to to hear your stories and thank you for i'm glad you're able to reach out uh after i tried to reach out to you and i i really hope that you're you're able to maybe touch base in a, in a few years and really experience some cool things up there in Alaska. Yeah, man. Hey, and look, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I hope everyone out there, uh, their story and tries to protect them.
at least the good ones, right? <laughs> but anyways, Jeremiah, it was nice meeting you. It was nice talking to everybody, and uh, you take care, and I wish everybody the best. Yes, sir. Please take a minute to help out the show by subscribing on YouTube, making sure you hit the bell so you don't miss any notifications, and share the episode on YouTube with a friend. Also, if you're listening to us on a podcast, thank you so much. Make sure that you're subscribed, share the show with a friend. Really, it's all about sharing the show wherever you can. If you've had a Bigfoot encounter related to the following or know someone who has, please reach out to me at BigfootSociety at gmail.com or pass on my email. Here's a list. If you've had any encounters in Oregon, which I'm sure there's probably a few of you out there, please feel free to reach out immediately. You can use email BigfootSociety at gmail.com. A special thank you to all the Bigfoot Society Patreon and YouTube channel members. It's your support that helps keep the show going, and I extremely appreciate it. If you want to join in the fun, you can join over at patreon.com forward slash the Bigfoot Society. I'll see you there. And again, thanks for listening.